Heavenly Father, we thank you, God. Thank you for the family we have here, for the fellowship, for the love. Thank you, God, that you intervened and you opened a door at Lighthouse Baptist Church. God, you did it. And you used the wonderful, beautiful people at Lighthouse Baptist Church to cause that door to open. And you brought your wonderful and beautiful sons and daughters here. And Father, we want to hear from you. We want to hear your word. And we're so thankful, God, for what you're revealing to us, for how you're revealing your word to us, and the depth and the sincerity and the importance of your word to us, God. So I'm asking you, Father, again, to just show up tonight. Send your Holy Spirit to fill this room and fill this place. And touch our hearts, God, and let your word, the very special power that resides only in your word, God, let that power come and be with us and touch our hearts and our minds and change us, God, from the inside out. And we thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. If you have your Bible, um, you can open up to 2 Peter chapter 2. We're going to be in verse 1 through 10. Starting in chapter 2 on verse 1. Give you guys a minute to get there. 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 1. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you, who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. Many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of the truth will be maligned. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their judgment from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness, with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. And if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by reducing them to ashes, having made them an example to those who would live ungodly lives thereafter. And if he rescued righteous Lot oppressed by the sensual conduct of unprincipled men for by what he saw and heard that righteous man while living among them felt his righteous soul tormented day after day by their lawless deeds then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment, and especially those who indulge the flesh in its corrupt desires and despise authority. Okay. Peter's introducing now false teachers. Last week we talked about Second Peter is about false teachers. And last week he didn't really come on to it very strong. But we had the first warning last week um, when we heard um, Peter speak of paying attention to the word. Pay close attention to the word, Peter said in chapter 1. This week he really introduces the segment on false teachers. This is what the warning in chapter 1 was about. It's chapter 2. God takes serious the respect for his word. This chapter shows the mindset of God towards the misrepresentation of the truth of his word. Peter now describes false teachers for us. And deeper in the chapter, which 
I want to ask you to read later the depth of the rest of chapter 2. We're not going to go into it next week because I want you to take some time to read it. And you're going to get the most of it out of this, what we read today and this lesson. Um, Peter now describes false teachers for us so that we as Christians will always recognize their characteristics and their methods. And in this chapter, Peter is revealing to give us the secrets and the abilities to see false teachers, to spot them, because he's warning us. And he's telling us also that God has a deep, deep bitterness and a very, very deep desire to punish those that malign his word. And when Leslie was singing and it said, Word made flesh, and I was thinking, the word is his son, and the word is him, and this is his word. And when I was thinking about the lesson, how God is going to punish those that malign his word, and when Leslie said, Word made flesh, I was thinking, no wonder why, God, do not malign my son. Do not malign my word. And as I'm reading this, I'm discovering what we're going to discover tonight is going to be some of the reasons why God is so powerfully against the maligning of his word, the misrepresenting lies, using his word to twist it into lies. The greatest sin of the Christ rejectors and the most damning work of Satan is to misrepresent God's truth and the resulting deception that follows. Nothing is more wicked than someone claiming to speak for God unto salvation of souls when in reality he speaks to the damnation of souls for Satan. The people... And you'll notice in verse 1, Peter says, But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be also among you. And the people in that time, Israel or the New Testament church, the people. False prophets arose in among the people and among you. The reference to the Old Testament people and the New Testament church. So there we have it. False teachers arise among the people. It's in the church of God, among the children of God, among the people. <clears throat> Satan has from the beginning always endeavored to infiltrate believers' lives and churches with false teachers. Since Eve, he has been in the business of deceiving people. We must not omit the truth when we preach. And we know that now. We have to speak the truth from the pulpit. This truth of God's Word cannot be omitted. And a big problem with the church today, so it is said is that the truth of God's Word is not being spoken in its entirety. We've already studied about suffering. We've already studied about things in First Peter. Uh, Peter is hard-hitting. He told us that we suffer for the sake of Christ, that we endeavor into suffering, that being a Christian is not all peaches and cream. There's suffering involved. And we have to know the truth of the word. I'm going to read something from you, uh, Jane. It's not in the, uh, in, in the writings. And then we're going to go to the scriptures. I'm just going to read from verse 20 and 22 just to give you a taste. So it's 2 Peter, verse 20 and 22, a little bit advanced from where we are now. Verse 20 says, For F... After they have escaped the defilement of the world by the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are entangled in them and overcome. The last state has become worse for them than the first. 
For it would be better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it, to turn away from the holy commandment handed on to them. It has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to its own vomit, and a sow after washing returns to wallowing in the mire. Just giving you an expression of what God has to say about false teachers and turning the way, turning away from the word, coming into the word, and then misrepresenting it and maligning it for your own benefit. Lying about the word to gain for yourself, to use it against, to deceive people, to use it for yourself. God has a lot to say in this chapter, and a lot of it is so powerful that I chose not to read it to you because you need to get a taste for yourself. Hear what God is saying. Hear what God is saying about false teachers and misaligning this word. Let's go to a few scriptures here. We're going to go to uh, 2 Peter 1.19. So we have the prophetic word made more sure, to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. This is um, last week's lesson, pay attention. That was Peter's first warning. I just wanted to go over the first warning from Peter in chapter 1. He starts off a little light in chapter 1. In chapter 2, he really gets to the meat of false teaching. Pay attention. Pay attention. Do not swerve from the word. Do not get away from the truth. Um, Matthew 7, 15. Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. 7, 16. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? Matthew 7, 22-23. Many will say on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Okay, I'm going to stop there and unfold a little bit of this for you. As we read this, we understand this verse is used a lot for people to say, um, normal Christians may say, well, God's not going to save everybody. Uh, you know, you didn't, you didn't go out and evangelize, or you, didn't, you weren't an usher at church, so you better watch out. And God is not speaking to this, because in the context of what we're reading today, in the context of this verse, you're going to see that God is speaking to people who malign the word. False prophets. Didn't we prophesy? Didn't we cast out demons? Didn't we perform many miracles? Normal Christians aren't going around doing that. We're just loving people, hoping that they change. We're just sharing with the people we love, our brothers and sisters, hoping that we can have a life change and a heart change. These are the people. You get the sense of who the false prophets are now? Who the ones that are laying hands and, and they're performing many miracles and casting out demons. They're the ones who have maligned the word who God says they take advantage of God's people for their own selfish gain. And as you read more of chapter 2, 2 Peter, you learn that these are the people that are worried about hearing from God and saying, I never knew you. God is going to say, I never knew you to the ones who maligned the word, the prophets. The ones who say, we casted out demons and we did all this work. And there's a problem with that. When it doesn't line up with the word of God. And I was relieved to know for the first time that this wasn't meant for just me and you. Just simple Christians that are trying to hear the word and honor it. This, The context of this scripture is more in line with those that are running false ministries. Preaching false hope and misaligning the word, and speaking things, and saying things in any account. We're not the judge of them. Who's the judge of them? God. But God is encountering us to know them, and to watch out, to beware. And that's our responsibility. Romans sixteen seventeen. Now I urge you, brethren, 
Keep your eye on those who cause dissensions and hindrances contrary to the teaching which you learned and turn away from them. Amen? Amen. So as we put it together, we learn that there's a lot of people running false ministries, misaligning the word. So Jane, I may just go and uh, pop in a few verses that you won't have from Second Peter. Um, Second Peter 17, these are springs without water and mist driven by a storm for whom the black darkness has been reserved. For speaking out arrogant words of vanity, they entice by fleshly desires, by sensuality, those who barely escape from the ones who live in error, promising them freedom while they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by what a man is overcome, by this he is enslaved." They are stains and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions. And as they carouse with you, having eyes full of adultery that never cease from sin, enticing unstable souls, having a heart trained in greed, accursed children, forsaking the right way. They have gone astray, having followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but he received a rebuke for his own transgression, for a mute donkey, speaking with the voice of a man, restrained the madness of the prophet. And these are springs without water and mist driven by a storm. Daring, self-willed, they do not tremble when they revile angelic majesties. Whereas angels who are greater in might and power do not bring a reviling judgment against them before the Lord. But these, like unreasoning animals, born as creatures of instinct to be captured and killed, reviling where they have no knowledge, will in the destruction of those creatures also be destroyed, suffering wrong as the wages of wrongdoing. There you have an idea of what I wasn't going to read to you, but you see that's Second Peter chapter 2. That's New Testament. That's Peter giving you an idea of how God feels about who? False teachers, maligners of the word. You have to become very alert and cautious. And you have to understand that the word made flesh is the word that God would have us to follow. It's very delicate, and you must become very precise in your walk. God will punish false teachers. Verse 4 through 6. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness, with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. And if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by reducing them to ashes, having made them an example to those who would live ungodly lives thereafter. Verse 4 through 10 is one long sentence in which Peter gives us three powerful illustrations. These illustrations are of past divine judgment on the wicked. These examples set the tone, lest anyone thinks that God is too loving and merciful to judge the wicked and false teachers and their deceived people. Lest you think that God is too loving and merciful it's a warning that you think that we're going to get away with maligning the word and following false teachers and living these lives. It's a warning. This was for our benefit. The illustration set the precedence for the future and final judgment on liars and deceivers. Although God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. The first one Verse 4, God did not spare angels when they sinned. Those angels, uh, according to Jude 6, did not keep their own domain. 
they entered men who lusted women, found in Genesis chapter 6. Before the flood, in 6, 1 through 3. And before the destruction of Sodom, in Genesis 19. The second example, God did not spare the ancient world from judgment, destroying them all by flood, found in Genesis 6, Genesis 6 through 8. The human race was reduced to eight people. The third example in verse 6, the third precedent for a future divine judgment on the wicked, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Three examples given by Peter in 2 Peter chapter 2 that show three examples of divine judgment against the wicked that are prophesying toward the final judgment. And this is where Peter begins to bring it all together. For those of us in this world today who don't think there's going to be a final judgment, these examples are set for us to know that there is going to be a final judgment. And that God is not too merciful and too loving to not punish those wicked ones. And the three examples, as we're reading this, we start to say, wow, I see it. Three examples, the Bible says these were made an example Verse 6, And he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by reducing them to ashes, having made them an example to those who would live ungodly lives thereafter. Why do they need an example? Because what's going to happen in the future? One more great and final judgment. Thank you. So it's coming. So thank you guys for being in the Word, for being children of God, for being loving and caring, for endeavoring in the Word. Jude 6 and 7. And angels who did not keep their own domain, but abandoned their proper abode... He has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, since in the same way as these indulged in gross immorality and went after strange flesh, are exhibited as an example in undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. Again, the word example. And again, we're bringing up the angels who... These are angels that God put on earth in Genesis chapter 6. And the angels went into the men, and you all heard about the abomination of the angels. It's a, it's a, it's a very good scripture to read, and it's a little bit confusing. Because who were these sons of God that went into the men and got into the women, and they were having um, ungodly children? That was called the... Uh, the the fall of mankind was in Genesis chapter 3, and the, tru- the corruption of mankind was in Genesis chapter 6. That was the corruption of mankind. Those angels left their abode, got into men, and those angelic beings took hold of the men and went into the women, and all of mankind was corrupted. And God has them where? Where does he have them? Eternal bonds under darkness. Those angels are kept in eternal darkness right now. Some angels are loose and some angels are kept in darkness. Those angels are kept in pits of darkness right now. A place that they hate to be. They hate it there. And those angels are not free to roam and bother you. Those angels that did that are kept in eternal, eternal bonds under darkness. Deuteronomy 13.5 But that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has counseled rebellion against the Lord, your God, who brought you from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery to seduce you from the way in which the Lord, your God, commanded you to walk. So you shall purge the evil from among you. Deuteronomy 13, 8 and 9. You shall not yield to him or listen to him, and your eyes shall not pity him, nor shall you spare or conceal him, but you shall surely kill him. Your hand shall be first against him to put him to death, and afterwards the hand 
of all the people. The dreamer, the one who distracts and takes you away from God, the one who leads you away. The message is God has a very serious attitude towards the ones who malign the word and try to lead his little sheep away. Ezekiel 33, 11. Say to them, as I live, declares the Lord God, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn back. Turn back from your evil ways. Why then will you die, O house of Israel? It's a special verse I put right in the middle. Do you see it? God wants you to what? He wants everybody out there that may end up with those angels in the pit of darkness. What does he want them to do? Turn from their ways. Turn from your ways. Turn, turn, turn. 2 Thessalonians 1, 8 and 9. Dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. This is New Testament. This is Thessalonians, some of our favorite books. The rapture, everything we get from Thessalonians. Eternal retribution, that's on the second coming. That's when God comes back. See, because we're in the rapture in Thessalonians, remember? When everybody gets to go and be with God, and God comes to deal out retribution to those who do not know Him, and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. So, I don't know about you, but I'm getting a sense of the reality of God, and how He is asking us to change our lives and serve Him in His Word. Deuteronomy 13, 10 and 11. So you shall stone him to death because he has sought to seduce you from the Lord your God who brought you out from the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Then all Israel will hear and be afraid, and you will never again do such a wicked thing among you. So when God punishes the wicked, what is his hope? That we what? We'll never do it again. That we'll learn God is good. These three examples were made a model, an unmistakable message to future peoples on earth that wickedness, evil, and maligning and lying against God's word will be judged. The Lord will rescue the godly. I saved this for last because we always want to end. We don't want to end with that. And you want to read chapter 2 for yourself and see what more God has to say. And it'll startle you because that was a light version of what God was speaking to me when I was doing this lesson. And I was telling one, you wouldn't believe what I just went through reading this. And that was a light version of what God truly has to say about, about wickedness. And so we saved the best for last. The Lord will rescue the godly, verse 7 through 10. And if he rescued righteous Lot, Lot oppressed by the sensual conduct of unprincipled men, for by what he saw and heard, that righteous man, Lot, while living among them, felt his righteous soul tormented day after day, by their lawless deeds. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation and to keep the, un the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment. And especially those who indulge the flesh in its corrupt desires and despise authority. God knows. God knows how to rescue the godly. Important, the most important point we need to know. Listen to what God is saying. We've been given ears to hear and eyes to see. The word to save us. We know what to do. It has been spelled out with great detail by God. I want to go to the scriptures now, Jane. Uh, Deuteronomy 13.4. You shall follow the Lord your God and fear him 
and you shall keep his commandments, listen to his voice, serve him, and cling to him. 2 Thessalonians 1, 6 and 7. For after all, it is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to give relief to you who are afflicted and to us as well when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire. God is promising right now that he's going to take care of you. It's just for me to punish those who punished you. I'm going to punish the liars. I'm going to punish the ones who betrayed you, lied to you, and cheated you, and did it with wickedness and evil, and never changed their lives. And we're suffering under that. God has promised you, if you stay the course, stay the course. Stay the course with Jesus Christ. Are we perfect? No. Stay the course. Keep your love for Him. Titus 2, 11 and 12. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires, and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. I love that verse. Because if you're wondering how to do it, and what are you supposed to do to avoid all those things, God is not making it hard for us. His grace covers your sins. He brings salvation to all by the blood of His Son. When you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're given a start like a baby, a newborn baby. You walk and you grow up, and He instructs the babies to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. 2 Thessalonians 1.10 when he comes to be glorified in his saints on that day and to be marveled at among all who have believed. For our testimony to you was believed. Specifically telling those who believe. Do you believe the Son of God? Do you believe that the Word became flesh and God's Word? And that's all you have to do. That is our duty is to believe on Christ. To take the free gift of God. By grace you are saved through faith. For it is the free gift of God that no man can boast, not by works. Titus 2.13 Looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. Do not play with your eternal destiny. Listen to what God is saying. And we thank God for the lesson that He teaches us. And that was a powerful, hard lesson. I don't even like teaching that. It gave me a stomach ache to think I have to come and teach Second Peter chapter 2. Because I'm not familiar with this stuff this hurts but God wants you to know and he wants to tell you ahead of time one thing for sure there's going to be a future judgment there will be a future judgment don't play with your destiny and God is sure to promise you that he's going to take care of you he's going to get those that got you. He says it's only just. And God is perfect and just. Loving and just. And desires that none should perish. Yes. I think that, um, good question. So how do we draw the line? Where do we take in 16 to turn away from them? You have to develop a sense of inner discernment. And you have to pray and ask God for wisdom. And it's not easy. Uh, we said before that Peter begins to describe false teachers for us so that we can um, have, begin to understand the mindset of God towards those mi misrepresenting His Word and that we can begin to understand and see who they are. That you can begin to learn to recognize the characteristics and the methods. 
You have to learn to recognize the characteristics and the methods of a false teacher or someone that's taking you away from the Lord. Between someone that truly loves the Lord and is still stumbling like all of us. And that takes great discernment. And God is trying to help us to learn the methods and the characteristics that you would have a sharp eye to know. Will that do you well? Yes. Because what did the Bible say that's going to happen to the people who are deceived by false deceivers? It's going to be the same thing that, or more that happened to the deceivers themselves. The subject is the same. The judgment is the same for those deceived as well as the deceivers. So we have to be very, very, very careful. Jesus Christ is the one. God's Son sent to earth to die on the cross. By His blood we are cleansed of sin. By His stripes we are healed. Everything is found in Jesus Christ. Everything is found in Christ. And to keep His word in good order in your lives.